As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and streamed live on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oates. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Ms. Dahl. Here. Mr. Holmes. I think he's on his way. Ms. Darby. Here. Ms. Mead. Ms. Mead. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. I've confirmed all council members are present. All right, thank you. I ask the city manager, Steve Rosenberg, note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council members Joel and Mead are participating on those Zoom platform and all other city officials are participating in chambers this evening. Thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members of city council. In addition to limited public seating in city hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel and the city's website. During this work session, and as in the past, there will be no opportunity for public comment. Public comment will be received during council's regular meeting, which will begin at 7.30 p.m. Instructions for public comment by telephone can be found on agenda for the regular meeting and on council's website at www.ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city dash council. Also, let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting, although being conducted in person, is also being conducted by Zoom with virtual participation by certain members of city council, given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID-19 outbreak, which is part of the total circumstances, make it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the city council ordinance 2020-04, regarding continuity of government, a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash COGORD 2020-04. All right. Um, with that said, I would like to remind everyone, um, if you come into the chambers, please wear your mask, and if you go throughout the uh, city hall, please have your mask on. If you wanna speak at the mic, uh, you may remove your mask. Uh, we do have some uh, disinfected wipes that you can wipe the uh, microphone down if you so choose to do, if you so choose to do so. There we go. Um, also, I would like to remind council members, uh, if you would like to speak, please address the mayor, and the mayor will point you out to speak. Please refrain from um, speaking over top of one another and any outburst. Uh, again, address the mayor and the mayor will recognize you to speak. Madam Mayor. Councilman, or excuse me, Vice Mayor Robertson. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the minutes, uh, or excuse me, approve the uh, work session uh, and the um, regular meeting agendas as printed. Okay, item number one is the consideration of work session and regular meeting agendas. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Councilwoman Darby. I second. We have a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Well, the next item on the agenda is item number two uh, for the work session agenda and item B for the regular meeting agenda, a discussion of resolution establishing the percentage of relief at 37% for purposes of the Personal Property Tax Relief Act. Mr. Rosenberg. 
Madam Mayor, Commissioner of the Revenue, Maggie Reagan will present this item. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. I come uh, before you each September once the personal property tax book has been certified to the treasurer to recommend a percentage of personal property tax relief that will exhaust the funds that are provided by the Commonwealth to the city of Stanton in the amount of $1,652,200 um, that will spread that amount of uh, relief across all um, qualified owners of personal property. This is basically the car tax, I'm sure you all are familiar. And I'll recommend this year that that uh, percentage be uh, set at 37%. And I'm happy to answer any questions council members may have. Are there any questions? Madam Mayor. Council yeah. McClabby. Maggie, when was the last time that the minimum was raised? I mean, right now I see it's at $1,000 for vehicles. Anything that has a value of less than $1,000 has no tax. That's correct. If the vehicle has a value of less than $1,000, the uh, entire uh, tax is taken care of by this amount. And then any vehicles, the value of vehicles over and above 20,000. So you're basically uh, divide, you're basically parsing out the, the information to everything that's below a value of 20,000. So how many years has the minimum been set at the 1,000 mark? It's, it's been that way since 2004 since 2000. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's set by the uh, state, it's not set by us. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions or comments for Ms. Reagan? And I always give you a, a little bit of what I call the fun facts yeah, each year when I do this. So I'll be happy to read this for you if you have a moment. Absolutely. So uh, we have 24,839 taxable vehicles. In the city this year, we're up 606 vehicles from 2019. Our most, the, the highest valued vehicle in the city is a Mercedes Benz. The most popular cars um, are Honda Civic and Honda Accord in first and second place, which is a flip from last year. Um, our top model uh, owner models are Ford, Toyota, Honda, Chevy, Nissan, Subaru. And we also have one Alpha, one Bentley, and one smart car. <laughs> the oldest taxable vehicle is still a 1909 Brush Roadster that the owner does not have the antique tags on. And the average uh, median age of vehicles or model year of vehicles is 2008. We have uh, 124 vehicles that are model year 2020 that are new, and we have 701 motorcycles in the city, with the most popular make being Harley Davidson. And our most popular pickup truck is, once again, the Ford F Series. Just a little bit of info for you. Fun facts. Thank no, you. No Thank Teslas you. this year. Yeah. Uh, no. We well, we have five. We we added two more of those, but they're not in the the uh, the on top. Uh, they're not on the top as far as the value is concerned this year. So Maggie, the, yes. the 1909, the, does he actually drive that occasionally on the road? You know, I don't know if if they drive it or not, but they, it still it still remains um, it, the tax it, a taxable vehicle because it doesn't have antique pl plates. But I think it yeah. probably is just garaged. Yeah, as an old car person, I, I think I would love to see it on the right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the next item on the agenda is item number three on the work session agenda and um, C on the regular um, session agenda. It's a discussion of grant application to Augusta Health for improved access to behavioral health services for individuals involved in the criminal justice system. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, Madam Mayor, Megan Roan, the Director of Blue Ridge Court Services will present this item. Madam Mayor, Mayor and members of council, what I would like to request tonight is um, approval. I actually submitted this grant. It was due September the 17th, so I actually submitted it last week. But I would just ask for approval to follow through um, with that submission. This is our Augusta Health Grant in the amount of $25,000. So we actually applied um, for the exact same amount that we applied for and received last year. And this grant allows us to have um, a licensed clinician to come in and run, we run six in-house groups, and we also provide individual counseling. 
Um, and so this allows us to be able to do that for our clients. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are there any questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, item number four is a presentation of proposed measures to encourage safe use of Shared Street in Gypsy Hill Park. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor Rodney Rhodes, uh, the city senior planner, will introduce this item. Good evening, Madam Mayor Oaks, city council members. Um, tonight, I'd just like to give you an update on an initiative um, that we're looking at um, to improve safety in Gypsy Hill Park. Several months ago, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee noticed that there was a significant uptick in the use of the park um, back in March, April, um, when um, people were eager to get outside the house um, and get some exercise. And we were looking for ways that we could improve the safety of all the users of the park. Uh, the committee worked a couple months to put together some draft recommendations. And after we had those sort of squared away, we had a joint meeting uh, with the Recreation Advisory Commission, uh, where we went over all these recommendations and uh, got some additional feedback from that commission. And, and then from those two committees, we formed a subcommittee of members and staff from those two organizations and we did some, fi um, some, some additional fine tuning of those recommendations. And at this time, I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah Holberg, who's the chair of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee to explain um, why we took on this initiative, what we see as the um, safety concerns, and then I will um, follow that up with some of the proposed recommendations. Thank you. Hi, um, I, I wanted to uh, start with saying that, um, you know, it was a very productive um, working session with the Recreation Advisory Committee. And I wanted to start with a quote from one of the old timers there, Mr. Bosterman. And what he said when we were talking about the park was, what I've seen in Gypsy Hill Park in his time there, strollers, scooters, skateboards, tricycles, bicycles, people with walkers, wheelchairs, cars, jeeps, buses from nursing homes, walkers from the time they can first walk to when they are nearly 100 years old. And I thought that was a great statement about our Gypsy Hill Park, which is a real jewel for the city. And so citizens do want and need safe and accessible places to walk and cycle that's consistently the top citizen request um, whenever we have input for the bicycle and pedestrian plans. And Gypsy Hill Park is key. The 1.3 mile loop is the most popular and widely used site, as we all know, whenever anybody wanna walk and there's no other place really to um, cycle if you're a, a child. And now with the pandemic, outdoor recreational space is more important than ever. So the bike ped committee was already working on this and um, the recreation, the parks and rec is always working on this. And then the pandemic came and it was sort of uh, really brought things into focus. Just to realize there are more people needing to go outside for exercise. And there are more people who are doing that at the park. And whenever you're at the park, you're sharing the roadway. There are a lot of different users, the vehicles getting to their parking spaces, and then you have walkers and cyclists, and you have all ages increasingly. I go there quite a lot now, and there are a lot of family groups, and there are, it's really neat to see kids with their bikes, but then the parents are screaming, whoa, slow, you know. It's, it's a lot of different users, and it takes more width. When you're social distancing, all of a sudden, width is much more of an issue. With the repaving last year, the area is a little bit wider and you can more easily see that there's space for people to recreate, but then there are also pinch points. And if cars are coming, uh, they can't really take it as a, as a lane to go in like a single, you know, a single direction road. So there is space, but there's not much guidance on how all these users can safely work it out. So that basically that's what these recommendations are um, to address some of the issues. One being the speed 
of, of cars primarily just to help people recognize the vulnerable people who are more moving slower than they are and the pinch points which are just at certain areas and conflicts um, between the users and also the entrances are not very safe it's it's difficult to get into the park safely and there are also um, a lack of directions in terms of whether you're even supposed to be going in a certain direction and there's a lot of opportunity to just make that more clear none of this really costs a lot of money and it's all can be done i think very um, common sense and i hope we've made a good start on that um, and so if you have any particular questions but basically that's the outline of just continuing to look at sort of a a refresh of how people can know where to go and, and what to do when they're in the park. Okay. Are there any questions for Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Councilwoman Mead. Um, I, I, this may be a question for Mr. Rosenberg and Ms. Beauregard, but um, because, uh, because the pandemic has increased activity in Gypsy, Gypsy Hill Park so much, I wonder if we've evaluated whether CARES Act funding could be used to make some of the improvements that are needed to make the park more safe and that the committee has recommended. Um, this is me. We'd have, to, we'd have to look into that. I'm not certain. Um, I would have to evaluate each of those recommendations to see if any of the CARES money could be used for that, but that's something we could certainly look into. Um, and depending on when those um, types of you know, improvements would be done. We only have till, you know, December 30th to complete. I mean, the projects would have to be completed by then to be eligible for CARES. So that's another thing is we're on a pretty tight timeline as far as the CARES money goes. But we can certainly, I'm happy to look into that and explore that. Thank you. And I have another question. Is, uh, do we have any estimate of the timeline and costs um, with this proposal? I think Mr. Rhodes has some more detail to share with council and perhaps that will answer some of your questions, Ms. Mead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve. Um, as far as the suggestions or recommendations that the committees are looking at, I'll go over this very quickly. And the first one is to develop policies that support Constitution Drive as shared recreation space with emphasis on safety. Um, it, I would note that these are just some suggestions. We're, we're not looking to implement all of them. Um, they'll be done in, in stages and phases. Um, and most of these are easily reversible. So if it doesn't work, we can take down a sign or, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not something that is, that would be there forever necessarily. Um, I, I would note that, uh, like I said, this is just some suggestions we threw out there. I would note that, you know, one time we were considering a, reducing the speed limit. Uh, Captain Brian Brown serves on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, and um, he did a speed study out there, and we determined that wasn't something that we need to address at this time. I was kind of surprised that there was almost 700 vehicles a day in the park, though, that came out of that um, speed study. Uh, number two is underta undertake educational campaign. This is very inexpensive, maybe no cost involved, as far as using social media, using the schools, using... Parks and Rec, uh, their brochures, flyers, maybe produce a map. Um, uh, number three, use markings on the roadway. We think um, people would be more inclined to get the message if it's right there in front of them, um, as opposed to being on a sign. Of course, we also suggest having additional signage, but on the roadway, it's right in front of you. Um, it would show, and, and in one case, show um, pedestrian symbols walking, you know, facing the cars. Mm -hmm. I live across from the park and for, you know, the past three years, and I always walked the wrong way <laughs> in the park until it was pointed out to me about six months ago. And there's, there's one sign at the entrance to the park that says, you know, walk facing Thank traffic. You, I never saw that sign in three years. Mm -hmm. So um, simple things like that we could do. Um, additional signs. Um, one of the... Um, um, it, we recently, well, in 2008, the city adopted a bicycle and pedestrian plan. Uh, we have also drafted a greenways plan, and both of those call for linkages to our parks from downtown. And with the um, soon-to-be-started project on Central Avenue, we think we should have additional signage to lead people to the park. 
I remember I was on Frederick Street at lunchtime one day, and this um, visitor came up to me. And she says, do you have any parks worth checking out here? But had no idea how to get there, or that we had this gym, you know, you know three quarters of a mile away. Um, uh, Sarah mentioned about the pinch points. Um, we're looking for low cost measures to, um, to improve those. Maybe it's just changing the striping of a parking space. Maybe it's removing one parking space. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, consider a couple additional crosswalks. We thought there's a couple places in the park that could benefit from crosswalks. Um, address safety issues around access to the park at the main entrance and also improve access from surrounding neighborhoods. So these are just some of the recommendations. Uh, we do not have estimates on cost. Um, we'll implement them um, as we have fundings to do it. Like I said, most of them are pretty low cost. Um, Public Works can make the signs. So pretty you know, low cost to do that. Um, some of the other things as far as improving access at the entrance and all, that may take more time and uh, further study. Um, I'd be glad to take any questions you have at this time. Chris Tuttle is also here to answer any questions you have from him. Right. Are there any questions? Yeah. Vice Mayor Robertson. Uh, Rod, you had one point I saw where I've seen other places where they did like bicycle lanes where they literally painted where it's like from here over to the, to the edge. That's where bicycles stay. Would that be something that they're considering or? Um, it can certainly be considered. Um, we have limited roadway in there mm -hmm. and it, it may be too tight in certain areas to have a car lane and a bike lane. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, um, we haven't done a bunch of measurements in there to determine um, where you could actually do that. Okay. There are other pavement markings, Vice Mayor Robertson, for example, Sharrows mm -hmm. that um, in a circumstance like the one uh, Mr. Rhodes is describing where there's not sufficient width that can be used as a signal to both drivers and cyclists that it's a shared roadway. So I think that that's a, a possibility that, yeah. that will be explored as well. Yeah, I saw that term somewhere in what I was reading. Yes, okay. All right, Councilwoman Darby. Uh, with the signage that goes on the roadway, would it be just strategically located throughout Constitution Drive or would it be, or is it something that would be like continuous? In some cases, it'd be something that would be you know, continuous to keep reinforcing um, the, you know, the, the notion or the idea that this is a shared road and, and pedestrians are supposed to be coming towards you, not with you. Um, we think there's certainly, as anyone that's been in the park, there's certain parts of the park that need more attention than others. So there's some parts on the backside, you really don't see as much of a conflict in users. But in some cases, yes, it would, you know, you know be ever, however many feet, you know, the guidelines call for. Councilman Holmes. Yeah, yes. Uh, Rodney, it, it really makes a lot of sense to take out those parking spots right there by the duck pond that, that area is very congested you know or, or put no parking signs there because i think a lot of people park there even though they're not supposed to and uh and you were talking you're saying put more actually painting on the road more di directional things and then just and, and augmenting it with signs that's correct and one of the road markings would just be something simple as saying slow you know just as a reminder uh, to not speed through there. You, you mentioned uh, one of the pinch points. I think we showed a photo of that in the briefing mm -hmm. next to the duck pond. And obviously you cannot expand the, the pavement there because of the pond and the culvert and what you could maybe remove one parking space. Uh, one other thing that we like to do is encourage people to park at, uh, at other places in the park. We have, um, you know, over at the ball fields and all, you have plenty of room to park there, but um, it's not as convenient. So people, um, go where they, you know, closer to the amenities in the park. But if we encourage more to park further away from the congested area, the better it would be. 
I think you have a lot of elderly people, and they, they probably can't walk as far as, as you know as some people could. You know. So, what are your thoughts on that concerning our elderly population? that like to park in the area that Councilman Holmes was just referring to? Well, I don't see a, a change in that from, you know, we may, you know, restripe a couple spaces, remove a couple, but I don't think it was going to be, you know, I was a significant talking, impact. I wasn't talking about any change. I was just making a statement that, oh, you okay. know, that a lot of times that, the, you know, you, you'll see people, that, you know, that probably have a harder time getting around. They're going to park closer because, like you said, everything is concentrated there at the yeah. entrance. Yeah, but when you have people, the able-bodied people that come there to, to jog 10 miles, and they take up on the spaces too, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. true, very true. All right, any additional comments or questions? All right, so this was- Arrow, uh, this is a friend of me. Councilwoman Mead. I'm, I apologize, I didn't jump in there fast enough. Um, I would just like to thank uh, Sarah Holberg. Um, she, she comes, she's in front of city council so often and spend so much time volunteering for our community um, and, and uh, in advocacy for uh, biking and pedestrian safety. And I think she, uh, she deserves uh, recognition for that. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, definitely. I was going to say thank you to everyone involved. And Sarah, your dedication to the city is just incredible. And so thank you so much for everything that you have done for the city and um, for this, um, the research that's been presented tonight. So, and um, Mr. Rhodes, thank you as well. Um, all right, if there's no additional questions or comments, we will go on to the next item, which is item number five on the work session agenda and D on the regular meeting agenda, a discussion of uncodified emergency ordinance ratifying, confirming, and affirming uncodified emergency ordinance 2020-04. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of council. Um, I will try to walk you through this item and let me start uh, by taking you back in time and offering you a bit of a chronology and this is detailed for you in the agenda briefing. The, the pandemic hit in earnest uh, back at the beginning of March. And on March 16th of this year, I declared a local emergency here in the city. That was then followed on March 18th by council's adoption of a resolution that confirmed my declaration of the local emergency. And then subsequently, on March 24th, Council adopted an uncodified emergency ordinance that did several things. So I want to, be, I, I want to try to provide some clarity to you this evening about what we're asking, what we're recommending. You have the declaration of the local emergency, and then you have the uncodified emergency ordinance. The, the declaration of the local emergency is sort of the broad umbrella for this whole program to deal with the pandemic. And it exists until council takes some affirmative action to terminate it. The uncodified emergency ordinance is an action that council took in order to deal with the overarching emergency. And it establishes some procedures for meetings, not only of city council, but also other city bodies like the school board, the Historic Preservation Commission, and the Planning Commission. So the procedures that are in the uncodified ordinance apply to all of those bodies and in fact to other city boards and commissions so that they too can take advantage of the procedures that are set forth in the uncodified emergency ordinance. So we are not asking you tonight to deal with the broad umbrella of the local emergency that was established in the declaration that was made in March. That's, a, that's an action that was initiated by me, confirmed by council, 
It continues until council acts to terminate it. It provides basically some um, administrative uh, authority in order to deal with the emergency. So it allows us to procure supplies, for example, in a different way than we would if we were not in an emergency. It deals with administrative issues like that. And we're not asking for any action with regard to that declaration, the, the overarching framework here. What's before you is an ordinance to extend the uncodified emergency ordinance, which under the state code can only remain in effect for a six month period. And so in order to continue the procedures or the measures that are in that ordinance that was adopted by council in March, it requires further action by council to extend it. And it can be extended for up to an additional six month period. And the ordinance that you have before you provides for an extension for that amount of time. Earlier today, I provided to you some additional materials by email. I'm not sure whether each of you has had an opportunity to review the additional information. So if I may, I'll share with you briefly. I had provided to you some data that comes from the Virginia Department of Health and the Harvard Global Health Institute about uh, the incidence of COVID-19 cases in Stanton and the Central Shenandoah Health District and provides to you a comparison uh, of that data with data for the entire state. And what the materials I provided to you show uh, is that uh, the incidence of cases, a seven day average of new daily cases here in Stanton is greater than the comparable figure for the state, 14.9 uh, versus 10.1. And that the current seven day positivity rate for the Central Shenandoah Health District is 9.9% versus 5.3% for the state as a whole. Um, we also uh, collected information about practices of other governing bodies of other localities, uh, specifically concerning meetings. And we found that um, we, we looked at 12 different localities in the region, the towns of Amherst and Bridgewater, the cities of Buena Vista, Charlottesville, Harrisonburg, Lexington, Lynchburg, Waynesboro, and Winchester, and the counties of Augusta, Rockbridge, and Rockingham. And we found that of those 12 localities, seven cities, two towns, and three counties, the practices are nearly even divided between in-person meetings and online meetings. The governing bodies of counties are more likely to be meeting in person. Those of more densely populated cities and towns are more likely to be meeting online. And some cities, including Lynchburg, Waynesboro, and Winchester are meeting in person. Uh, in the case of Winchester, they're meeting in another location outside of council chambers. And we've discussed that subject previously. And if, and if, uh, if council ultimately determines not to uh, enact the ordinance extending the continuity of government measures for another six month period or even some lesser period of time, it would be my recommendation that we find an alternative location for council meetings uh, because I don't think you can see the setup that we have here today. And if, if two more council members were to return to chambers, it would be difficult to safely accommodate er everyone um, in, in the meeting. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the only two remaining items that I want to share are to, to reiterate that the procedures that exist and are before you for possible extension apply not only to city council, but to all other city bodies. Uh, I left out the economic development authority. Um, that, that's one body that has relied 
um, on the availability of these procedures. And then finally, I note that we have already noticed for the October 8th meeting some public hearings before council that provide for in the notice uh, public participation either in person or by electronic means. And so if, if it's council's will not to extend uh, for some period of time, we would have to address uh, the issue of those notices that have been issued already. I'm happy to answer any questions and try to clarify anything that may have been confusing to you. Right. Are there any questions for Mr. Rosenberg? Councilman Holmes. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Steve, uh, as far as, uh, uh, are there any projections on what they, the, as we get into fall, uh, that, that there'll be more increases? Everything I hear is it's gonna be more cases come fall. The, the closer we get to being all closed up and stuff, I mean, have, have they given you any kind of indication of, or percentage they're thinking it's going to uptick? Uh, Mr. Holmes, I have, I have, I don't have anything directly from the Virginia Department of Health. I, I see some of the same coverage to which you're referring, um, but I, I think, you know, I, I think it's difficult to say. I think it's difficult to say definitively for anyone. Um, I think it depends in large part on how people conduct themselves, you know, over the course of the next several weeks as to whether there's uh, a spike in the months ahead. I, I, I do think if, if you look at the materials um, that I had provided to you, um, some of these, some of this data is graphically presented and you can, I think we're on, we're on the downward slope of a curve right now. Um, there had been a peak. It, it's a downward slope, but here in Stanton, it's still at a level that's higher than um, you know anything that we saw back in March when uh, when Council first enacted this this uncodified emergency ordinance. Any additional comments or questions, Councilwoman Darby? Mr. Rosenberg. Um, the, you, you mentioned that the 14, I believe you said 14.9% was the, the number for the Central Shenandoah Health District. That's actually, that's the number for the city of Stanton. What did you say for the, the Central, my point is the Central Shenandoah Health District, is that, that encompasses everything basically along the I-81 that, corridor. That's correct. And, and the, that includes James Madison University, as well as some other places. Yes, that so, the, so the figure that I provided for the health district was the percent positivity. Okay. Um, the, the number of cases was specific to the city of Stanton. Okay, uh, and then I have another question. Um, so we're all, the state of Virginia is obviously under the governor's mandated order regarding the pandemic. So I hear what you say in regards to why this broad declaration was, you know, brought forward in the first place to give specific authority, you said. So what, can you elaborate as to what authority it does give you? As so again, so this is, I want to, want to be clear to separate these items. The declaration of the local emergency is is not what you're being asked to act on this evening uh, but that that declaration of local emergency um, does things very different than what the governor's executive orders do so the governor's executive orders largely regulate the conduct of other of other parties. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, they're imposing standards and guidelines to be observed by uh, non-governmental actors, whether those, in, whether those are individuals or businesses establishing uh, standards for, the, for conduct that's acceptable in the midst of the pandemic. The declaration of the lo of local emergency um, in contrast, 
implements the city's emergency operations plan and provides to city staff certain administrative authority to take actions to respond to the emergency that has been declared. And the best example of that that I can give to you is again, um, uh, it, uh, it, it's sort of moves to the side some, this is one example, moves to the side some of the requirements that have to be observed for procurement purposes. So, the, so that if we need PPE in, in a quantity and we need it quickly, we don't have to jump through some of the hoops that would ordinarily apply to purchases by the city of goods and services. So the, the, what the declaration of the local emergency does is it gives us as a locality flexibility. It allows us to be nimble in the response, mm -hmm. uh, which is very different than what the governor's executive order or orders do. Um, and it's also different from what the continuity of government ordinance does, which is primarily to establish the procedures that allow city council and other bodies of the city to conduct their business um, in, in the way that it's been conducted for the last several months. I understand. So is this is something that is, is this common amongst, amongst localities to have the same, you know, declaration of an emergency and then uh, uncodified ordinance. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm I'm going to answer the question and then I'm going to turn to Mr. Gwynn um, to invite his input. But I think not only is it common in response to this event, mm -hmm. but it's probably um, overwhelmingly common in, in the Commonwealth for there to have been. A declaration made and for localities to have adopted a resolution or an ordinance uh, I'm not sure whether one or the other is required that establishes these sorts of continuity of government procedures and based on everything that I'm hearing you say and it was in the briefing obviously you you strongly believe that this is something that we need to continue as we move forward uh, I, at this time uh, my the the staff recommendation to council is to extend the ordinance for another six month period um especially given uh the the current state of the public health emergency um i think i think we've all settled into a, a pattern and a routine and you know what i've called a new normal um but um you know, we, we did confer um, as recently as today with the uh, with Dr. Carnegie of the Central Shenandoah Health District concerning these issues. And um, based on what we heard from her, it only reinforces the, the recommendation that we've made that the ordinance be extended for another six month period. Madam Mayor. Councilman Claffey. Um, I have a question for Steve, Mr. Rosenberg. Um, didn't your original declaration of, of a local emergency grant you the powers necessary to procure items you need? It, it did and it does and it remains in effect and it's not, and, and that's not the focal point of the item that's before you this evening. Okay. Now, I'm aware that the school board is, is meeting in this room in person. I participated in an EDA meeting today that was all Zoom, and city council is doing a hybrid. So what direction are we getting from our city manager as to how to run these meetings? Um, it seems like we have all three going simultaneously inside our city. Hybrid like we have in person. I mean, isn't that 
part of the declaration of local emergency where you are granted the power to determine how this is to be done and in which case why isn't there consistency well i can speak um you know both the eda and the school board are separate political bodies and um, mr gwynn would would you um uh, uh, they're separate political bodies and and as such they have the authority to determine for themselves how to conduct their meetings so the the ordinance that was adopted by council establishes the framework of what is permissible but it doesn't require that a particular body exercise the authority that's been provided to meet by electronic communication Okay. Now, let's talk about restaurants. Terry and I talked today, and and um, I guess the interesting point that came out of our discussion is it's very unclear how many people are allowed at a table. <laughs> Can we have a table of six? Can we have a table of eight? Can we have a table of 18? Are you interested in, in any of that type of direction because of the local emergency <clears throat> councilman claffey the um the restaurant guidelines have been established by executive order issued by the governor of virginia and the virginia department of health is the agency that has been designated as the agency that's responsible uh, for the enforcement of the requirements of those orders. Um, we have fairly regular communication with uh, both Dr. Cornegy and a member of her staff, um, conveying to them compl complaints as they're received and uh, calling issues to their attention, but th that's primarily the responsibility of the Virginia Department of Health. Is it clear, Terry? No, it's not clear. But uh, for me personally, you know, I, I, I have I have taken out about half of my tables and spread my rest. I'm lucky to have two floors and was able to spread my thing out. And they say the longer that you're in a group, the more chances of they are of, of transmission. transmission. So you figure if you got somebody in a group for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, or more, the chances of a mass helping or, or anything goes down. So I, I would think that, you know, a lot of it depends on ventilation. A lot of it depends on a lot of different things, you know. And, uh, and with the health department, you know, um, I think they're kind of just feeling their way through some of this stuff themselves. What, you know? what is the guidance, Terry, as far as like how many are allowed? At a well, the whole thing was, it was, uh, when it originally came out, when we first started being able to see people, we couldn't see parties of six or more. Mm -hmm. And and I was never aware that that had changed until this last weekend. And this last weekend, uh, uh, we had people coming in and say, well, you know, we can go to this place and there's be 10 of us or whatever. But, you know, uh, I hadn't changed until I called the health department. And the health department told me that it really depends on the... Um, um, if they're all family, you know, you don't want to have, you know, a, a lot of people getting up and move. The biggest thing is you don't want people moving around without masks and stuff like that. If you got somebody that sits in the same spot for mainly the time that they're eating, but they're looking at people eating there an hour, an hour, an hour and a half. They're not looking for them being there three or four hours, you know. Um, so uh, I think, you know, as far as, I think this is a whole different situation here you know um i mean people choose to go out to eat you know i personally if i had my choice i would rather be doing zoom but you know i have no leg to stand on because i work in a restaurant and i see a thousand people a week but you know if i was somebody i'd be more concerned about sitting next to me than uh than you know than uh 
you know, uh, <laughs> I'm coming over there a little bit. Closer. But you know, I mean, it's you know, I I I I personally think that you you know that there's I don't see anything wrong with the way we've been conducting our business. I think it's a good thing that we can do a hybrid because we never know when it's going to take a step back, you know. And we're already and we've kind of got most of the bugs out of it. Sometimes we have a little audio problem and stuff. And I think overall, I think it's been working okay. And most of, a lot of my meetings that I've had other than here are all Zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, this was the, I think we are even the you know, historic stamp that was of a hybrid of Zoom and, and uh, in, in person. Madam Mayor. Councilman Clapping. Yes. City Manager, Mr. Rosemary, what three things are you doing as a city manager that makes the confirming of the extension of the declaration of local emergency important to our city? Um, Mr. Claffey, again, um, you know, I think there's some boilerplate language in here that probably sweeps the declaration of the emergency up in the action that you're being asked to take this evening. But that's not the, that, that's not really what this is about. So if you wish to remove that language from whatever ordinance is to be considered by council, we can provide that. The, declara the local emergency would continue. The, the focus tonight is on the continuity of government provisions and the extension of those for some additional period of time in order to I get that permit I get that yeah. well in the in the governance portion that we're just talking about that we're extending what are the three most important things that you are doing for our city now that would justify us to extend it for an additional six months well uh, again, the, the critical point in the extension is that it permits this hybrid meeting. So it, it's not about what I'm doing. It's about what it permits council and the other boards and commissions of the city to do. But you're admitting that each one of the individual bodies can do as they choose, school board, in person, EDA, Zoom only. Uh, the library board is conference call. <laughs> There's another one. But I guess what I'm saying is, are you gr are you just saying have at it, do whatever you want, or are you do you have three concrete proposals that you can point out that you are directing the city to do by asking us to extend this for six more months. That there are, give me three things that we're really going to uh, benefit by you having a state of emergency and, and having this resolution. Well, I think I already, uh, again, I'm sorry, I, I don't quite understand the question because the the local emergency is not the focal point of the action that you're being asked to consider this evening. I think that I've already described to Ms. Darby um, two, well, two benefits of the continued local declaration are the, um, the implement, that it permits the implementation of the city's op emergency operations plan. It triggers that plan. So that plan is, is in place um, and allows us to respond to the emergency as necessary. And then secondly, uh, the other benefit that I would point to of the continuation of the local emergency is the um, abbreviated or lessened procurement requirements in order to purchase goods and services in order to respond to the emergency. But those, that, that all comes under the local declaration, which I made and council confirmed, which is really separate from the continuity of government provisions of the ordinance, which is what requires the, an extension by council this evening.
Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Councilwoman Mead. I wonder if Mr. Claffey could share an example because uh, candidly, I'm not sure uh, what he's looking for either. I'm just, I'm curious what, what the advantage of extending this for six more months is if there's a need. We have state guidelines. We have health department guidelines that our restaurants are having to follow. And the procurement thing, I think way back on in March 12th, when the original declaration came about, the city manager has the ability to arrange any procurement of any items he needs to get, and we're gonna back them. So I'm wondering the continuity of government for the next six months is, uh, I'm questioning why we need this. So the, 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 the Department of Health guidelines and the state guidelines to which Mr. Claffey refers do not address the issues that are in the emergency ordinance that was adopted in March and that is before you for possible extension this evening. There, so, uh, and, and I apologize for um, my apparent inability to explain it clearly, but those measures deal with the regulation of the conduct of other parties, individuals, businesses, what they can and what they can't, can't do. Who needs to wear a face covering? How many patrons you can seat in a restaurant? Um, what kind of events you can have? How many people can attend those events? All of those measures that you're referring to deal with that. They, they come at the issue of the pandemic from that perspective. The continuity of government ordinance, uh, ordinance addresses the internal operations of the locality. And the primary benefit of that ordinance is that it allows the flexibility in the manner in which meetings are conducted. I have one more question. Councilwoman Toby. Mr. Rosenberg. How much uh, is, does the city pay for the, the Zoom subscription? So to, to echo um, our IT director, Kurt Plowman, um, who shares with me, it's three to $400 per year. And I will tell you that it, it's used extensively, not only for meetings of council and boards and commissions, but it's utilized by staff on a regular basis, both for internal meetings and also for meetings with between city staff and, and parties who are outside of the city. Is, and that's something, has, has the city had that prior to this or when this um, ordinance went into effect, is that something that we, we started then? Um, the, it, it, if it was being used prior to the pandemic, Council Member Darby, its use was sparing. Um, it, its use, I think, has increased exponentially um, since the pandemic. And, you know, staff would use it and can use it for day-to-day -day business, whether an emergency declaration is in place or a continuity of government ordinance is extended. You know, as staff, we would continue to use it, but it, it cannot be continued to be used as it has been in the absence of some extension of this ordinance, whether that's for six months, three months, one month, um, without the extension of the ordinance, the, the practice can no longer be observed. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. I just want to ask a clarifying question. Okay, go ahead, uh, Councilwoman Mead. Thank you. Ms. Mr. Rosenberg, do you anticipate that when the uh, pandemic uh, is not part of our lives anymore, that, uh, that Zoom use will continue? 
uh, amongst members of the city staff because it's a more efficient and effective way of bringing people together uh, for, for meetings. Ms. Mead, um, I don't think it's the answer for every meeting. I'm not saying it is. Uh, but but um, I know in my own uh, experience, I can see a preference for the Zoom platform over a telephone call, for example, um, down the road. So I think um, like many um, responses to the public health emergency, uh, the use of um, Zoom and other platforms like it will become um, a more common part of the way that we as an organization conduct our business. Councilman Holmes. Yes, and, uh, and I can understand the reason for extending this thing is because, you know, some people are worried about their health, you know, uh, and, and if you can do everything from home, and not have and not have to be exposing yourself. I don't. I don't. I, I think that's a great idea. I think it's, it's it's nice and safe, and and it's something that we should try to offer all of our employees. You know, because it just it's just with this pandemic, you never know. Some people's immune systems and everything like that are are much weaker, or they're older, and and you know, and you just don't want to make it to where that they have to put themselves in harm's way just to come to a meeting. I mean, think about all the people that are on a lot of our committees that, you know, they might, they might not decide to, to, to be on a committee if they, had, if they had to be there in person during these times. You know, I know in, on, in both the uh, uh, tourism meeting and the uh, 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 his, historic stamp meeting, you know, we have people who do both. You know, and I could see one of one of us gets sick. It would be great to be able to fall back and still do our meeting from home when we're sick. You know, and it might not be that we have the virus, but we're just sick. So it, it just makes sense. It's, it seems like a really nice safety thing to have to fall back on. Vice Mayor Robertson. Well, I know I was just simply just listening to all sides. I just thought I'd listen to everything. I. I would be in favor. I mean, I'm personally in favor of extending it, but I will be honest with you. I uh, just cannot see it uh, for six months. I just, I, I just, in my heart, I can't see that. Uh, what were you thinking? Well, I'll be honest with you to be <laughs> probably one month at a time. Just to take a look at it. We keep our, we can keep our finger on, on everything and we can do it and become more responsive that way. And just simply to do a blanket six months, three months, I, you know, now, we can talk about it. I'm sure we'll make that decision that, you know, in the regular meeting, but that's just my, that's my gut right now. Mayor Dillon, I mean, Mayor, that's oops, okay. I'm Councilwoman, or, pardon me, Councilwoman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm an ugly woman here. Uh, you know, it's the, Holmes, go ahead. You know, just with the holidays coming up and everything, it just seems to do that on a, cause you know, we get into November and December, we'll only have one meeting a month unless something mm -hmm. drastic happens. So, I mean, at least I would say it would benefit us to at least extend it to the end of the year, instead of bringing it up every month and having to dedicate part of our meeting to discussing this over and over again. I don't, I don't you know, I mean, I just, I don't see a, a benefit in having to bring it up every month. I don't know. Well, maybe that's a compromise. All right, um, we are actually over time. So if there are no additional comments or concerns, I call the work, ses work session closed and everyone's on break. All right. As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and streamed live on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oaks. Here. Ms. Darby. Here. Mr. Holmes. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. 
Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Ms. Dahl. Here. Ms. Me. Here. I confirm that all council members are present. Thank you. I ask the city manager, Steve Rosenberg, note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, council members Dull and Mead are participating on the Zoom platform. All other city officials are participating in chambers. Thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members of city council. In addition to limited public seating in city hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel and the city's website. During matters from the public and council's agenda towards the end of the meeting, public comments will be taken in person and by telephone. Members of the public who wish to participate in such matters by telephone at the appropriate time may call 844-854-2222. And when prompted, enter the access code 619-358-HASHTAG. Callers will be recognized in order. The public is reminded matters from the public is a time for counsel to simply listen to your comments. Each speaker will be limited to five minutes. Detailed instructions for public participation by telephone have been publicized over the course of the past week on the city's website and Facebook page and can be found on the agenda for the, this meeting and on the council's website at www.ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city dash council. Also, let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting, although being conducted in person, is also being conducted by Zoom, with virtual participation by certain members of City Council, given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID-19 outbreak, which is part of the total circumstances makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the City Council Ordinance 2020-04 regarding continuity of government a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash COGORD 2020-04. All right. Now with that said, I would like to remind everyone if you come into uh, City Hall, uh, in the chambers, anywhere, if you can please wear your mask, uh, if you would like to speak at the podium under matters from the public, uh, you may remove your mask. We do have um, some sanitizing wipes that you can use on the microphone. Also, I'd like to remind the uh, city council members to please um, address the mayor when you would like to speak and the mayor will recognize you. Um, please refrain from any outburst or speaking over top of one another. Um, again, if you uh, would like to speak, please recognize the mayor and the mayor will recognize you. All right, the next item on the agenda is the invocation moment of silence. And tonight is my turn. Pledge. 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 Oh, oh, oh well, sorry about that. Let's do that pledge first. Please join me if you would like. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Now's the invocation moment of silence, which tonight is my night. Um, I uh, need to give a disclaimer that's um, required by the United States Supreme Court to advise that I will be given a Christian prayer tonight. Uh, we are allowed to give a prayer um, with any religion, and I choose a Christian prayer. If you would like to join me, feel free. If you would not like to join me, you do not have to. So if you would care to, please bow your heads. Dear Lord, my desire is to consistently welcome your guidance into this city council chambers and to lead the city council. We want your presence and perfect wisdom to illuminate our thoughts, decisions, and actions. We know that this illumination is possible, and through welcoming it, we will be more effective and joyous servant leaders to the people of Stanton. 
We ask this with all your many blessings. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So the next item uh, is the mayor's report. Um, the first item I would like to read a proclamation. I forgot my glasses, so I'm going to do my best. Do you have some? Yeah. Hold on one second. I'll give you mine, but I'm, you can never see with them. Thank you, Councilman Holmes. All right, much better. All right, City of Stanton, Virginia, proclamation. Eugenia Bex Taylor. Whereas on September 24th, 1930, Eugenia Bex was born in the city of Stanton. And whereas shortly after her 18th birthday, the athletic young lady who played high school sports was sent for a two week American Red Cross training course and attended the National Aquatic School so that she could become the first lifeguard at Montgomery Hall Park Pool. And whereas she worked for 10 years every summer at Montgomery Hall Park Pool, even after Marion, Elzon, El, El, Alonzo. Alonzo, thank you, <laughs> Alonzo C. Taylor, and moving out of state to raise seven children. And whereas, in addition to her lifeguarding duties, Mrs. Taylor taught swimming classes every morning, taught swimming to Girl Scouts at the summer camp, and on her own in the evening, she would teach elderly women who expressed a desire to learn how to swim. And whereas, with her return to her hometown, she took over the family business and became a well-known caterer in Stanton in the surrounding area. And whereas, as an active volunteer for the Stanton Augusta Rescue Squad and her leadership in the Thomas Field VFW Auxiliary, Mrs. Taylor continues to be a leader in the city of Stanton. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by Stanton City Council that the city of Stanton recognizes September 24th as Eugene Bex Taylor Day and commemorates Eugenia Bex Taylor on her 90th birthday in appreciation of her valuable leadership throughout the years that benefits the past, present, and future community of Stanton. Dated this 24th day of September 2020, Andrea W. Oaks, Mayor. So happy birthday, Miss Eugenia Bex Taylor. 90 years old, that's great. And she's done so much for the city of Stanton. Um, I'm gonna keep these for another second if you don't mind, Councilman Holmes. Uh, so the next item under the mayor's report, I would like to mention the uh, sad passing of Supreme Justice Ruth Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg was an icon for the woman's uh, the women's movement in the country. Uh, as you all know, Supreme Justice Ruth Ginsburg was the second woman to sit on the United States Supreme Court. The first was uh, Supreme Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, Justice O'Connor and Justice Green, uh, Ginsburg has made it possible for women to be able to serve in positions such as um, behind the bench. My sister, who's a circuit court judge, uh, we have here in Stanton, Circuit Court Judge Reed. Um, both of these women are able to serve as judges because Supreme Justice O'Connor and Supreme Justice Ginsburg laid the foundation. Now, Supreme Justice Ginsburg, during her life, did so much for every woman in the United States. And in her passing, I suspect she will continue to do so. So Godspeed to Supreme Justice Ruth Ginsburg. Uh, next, I would like to mention that uh, several of us on the uh, City Council attended, um, a, well, it was a grand opening for the Blackburn Inn and Spa. Um, it was very exciting. What a uh, beautiful building. And it shows that uh, you can take an old building and refurbish it and make it look like brand new. Absolutely beautiful. Um, I'd also like to mention that I attended the Celebration of Holiday Lights meeting with the SDDA this past Saturday. Uh, these two uh, entities are coming together to see if they can uh, make the holidays special despite the pandemic going on. Any announcements, I will let those two groups uh, make any future announcements. Also, I attended a meeting with the Stanton Citizens Police Academy Alumni Association, and they too are um, still planning their shop with a cop in December. So it looks like um, 
folks are still planning for the holidays and trying to make, make it special for everyone uh, within the city of Stanton. So that's very much appreciated. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, school board member Bob Boyle is in the audience. Thank you very much for attending our meeting. Uh, we love to see um, your smiling face behind the mask. <laughs> and um, I'm going to take this moment and ask um, our city manager, Mr. Rosenberg, can you please tell us a little bit about this award that our assistant city manager just recently received? Uh, certainly, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, Ms. Beauregard and I are both uh, members of the International City County Management Association, known commonly as ICMA, which is a professional association for local government managers. And ICMA has a credentialed manager program um, uh, that uh, and participants in the program who are awarded the, the credential by ICMA have demonstrated um, a, a level of education and experience in the field of local government management that is recognized by the professional association and their um, are various requirements to be satisfied in order to obtain the credential and uh, and then additional requirements to be satisfied to maintain the credential on an annual basis. And so uh, Ms. Beauregard recently completed the requirements uh, for the recognition by ICMA and was notified um, by the organization that, uh, that, that, that the credential would be issued um, shortly. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Right, good. Uh, it goes to show that we have a wonderful staff um, down here at City Hall. All right, well, that concludes the mayor's report. Um, the next item is the additional items by members of council. Uh, we'll give Mr. Holmes back his glasses. <laughs> I can speak without him. Thank you. Now I can see. <laughs> Mayor Oates, uh, I'd also like to talk about uh, 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 Justice Ginsburg, and you know, not only did she do a lot of things for women, but for uh, LBGQ and 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 other uh, groups. Her biggest thing was she, she was able to work with people who had opinions totally different than hers, and 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 she was able to not let it become a. Uh, a I mean, she disagreed, but it was not like combative. And I think that that's something that all of us here could learn. You know, um, we've not set the best uh, uh, standards so far for some of our meetings. And uh, and I, I would I would hope that you know that uh, that we could work on that and and become a little bit better at uh, concentrating on on what we have in common and not what we have apart. And, uh, and I would just like to hope that, uh, that we're able to do that in the coming months. Thank you. Any additional items from council members? Vice Mayor Robertson. And um, I too will put in my condolences to uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, family on her loss. Um, Ruth Bader, as Terry said, actually her, her best friend on the court was Antonin Scalia, the arch conservative, and she was the arch liberal. But they did, they worked together uh, and were best of friends, uh, but they disagreed uh, on policy a lot. Um, and, I, and I must admit, I had, a, had the pleasure of actually attending uh, down here at the uh, Visual Aid. I actually went to see the notorious RBG. That was kind of a, a fun movie. I enjoyed that. Um, the other thing, and this is on the medical front, I would say, um, as a pharmacist, I, I would encourage all of our citizens, uh, if you have not yet done so, to get a flu shot this year. Uh, the CDC is highly recommending it. Uh, it is available, and uh, they are recommending it and to get it as early as possible because, uh, you know, now that we're with possible to be fighting the flu, we're also fighting the COVID. Uh, 
I'm one that I argue with my doctor that uh, I'm one who thinks that if you get the flu shot, that it actually uh, ramps up your immune system and helps you fight off other things. And he says, well, I'm not so sure, but I, I believe in it. So I would, I would simply encourage, if you're so inclined, to get a flu shot as soon as possible to try to protect yourself from the flu. I know a lot of people think when, you know, and, and it's a misconception. People, they say, well, I get the flu, or I get the stomach flu. It is not the same thing. The stomach flu has nothing to do with the flu, the, uh, you know, the lung flu, because that is a terrible, terrible thing to get. So that's just my two cents tonight. All righty. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Uh, Councilman Clappy. I just want to say that yesterday we had a nominating committee meeting where uh, we, Ms. Darby and myself were able to interview eight people. And I just want to thank the citizens of Stanton for the, uh, the willingness to come out and support the city. And we, we really talked to some great people yesterday. And it makes you proud to be a member of Stanton. And uh, I want to thank everybody that came out for an interview. And uh, we're, we're hard at it. So we'll, we'll be getting back to everybody. But thank you to everybody that participated. And thank you to everybody on all the boards and commissions in Stanton that give their hard work to the service of our great city. Amen. Thank you. All right. I'm moving on to our regular Hero. This is Councilwoman Mead. Councilwoman Mead. Thank you. Um, I would just like uh, to add the, uh, an item about the Lewis Creek Watershed Advisory Committee. The committee met uh, for the first time um, uh, earlier in September since March. Um, we had the best attendance I've seen in the two years that I've been part of that committee. And it was because we, um, we met on the Zoom platform and uh, folks who couldn't normally attend because of the hour and because they have kids and, and uh, homework to help with and that sort of thing normally wouldn't be able to attend. So, uh, so I think that's a, um, uh, uh, you, know, a, 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 you know, maybe a sign of uh, changing times. Um, the committee has now a full complement of members and new leadership with Mr. Fred uh, Blanton stepping into the role of chairperson and Robert Clemmer elected the committee vice chair. And, but I want to take a minute and uh, recognize Mr. Tom Yago, who uh, stepped down from his role as chairman uh, for his uh, years of dedicated leadership of the committee. I spoke with one of the 20-year members of the committee uh, earlier this evening, and he told me that when he returned to Stanton in 1999, he met Tom Yago. Tom was manning the Lewis, Lewis Creek Watershed Committee booth at Earth Day and, uh, and I don't think Tom Yago has missed an Earth Day uh, in, the, in 20 years. And he also added kites and critters uh, to his agenda for providing education on the watershed to citizens of Stanton. He, um, he really uh, kept the committee together through waxing and waning interest in the community and, uh, about the watershed and about, uh, about stormwater. Um, and he kept education at the forefront of the committee's mission and purpose. And he maintained, um, the, I, I thought this was a fascinating aspect of the job. He maintains very detailed records of E. coli pollution in Lewis Creek. And he's always on the alert, on the alert for spikes that can't be explained. Um, and I have to say that he made a valiant effort to make E. coli a fascinating subject. Uh, so the committee will greatly benefit from his continued involvement as a member in the coming years and uh, as the committee seeks to expand um, the education opportunities to help cit citizens understand how they can help uh, with stormwater management. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. This is Carolyn Dull. Councilwoman Dull. Uh, I'd like to mention that I attended the uh, Stanton Augusta Waynesboro Chamber of Commerce State of the Metro, uh, which was a virtual meeting uh, this week. And uh, it, it focused on economic development, of course. And uh, happy to see that we had several uh, Stanton City staff members that made presentations during that meeting. Uh, also, I attended the WebEx for Dominion Energy 
uh, that in regards to the uh, transmission line rebuild from Stanton, the substation in the heart of Stanton uh, to Harrisonburg is a 23 miles. Uh, it will be beginning in October. They anticipate Stanton to Verona will be um, taken care of between October and May. The, uh, the old H poles are being removed. Uh, the new ones will be taller. They're going to be 66, I think, feet tall. Uh, they should follow in the same roadway. But they talked about danger trees, and so there may be more trees lost in uh, this replacement because they're going to cut down trees that are not in the right of way, but if they fell, they would end up within 10 feet of the lines. So they're, those they're going to be cutting down. So just to make people aware, you'll be seeing that activity uh, going on starting in October. Uh, next, I, I wanted to uh, extend my condolences to the family of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and to our country for the immense loss uh, of her intellect through the years. And I have a quote from her that <clears throat> I'd like to read at this time. We should not be held back from pursuing our full talents, from contributing what we could contribute to the society because we fit into a certain mold because we belong to a group that historically has been the object of discrimination. And then finally, uh, from one mama to another, I will say her name, Brianna Taylor. I ask you to say her name, Brianna Taylor. Thank you. All right, thank you. Madam Mayor. Councilwoman Darby. Uh, the only thing that I would like to add this evening is uh, along with the nominating committee that Mr. Claffey mentioned, um, I did attend a planning commission meeting and that was interesting as well as uh, two school board meetings. And I would like to say uh, thanks to Mr. Boyle for uh, the work that he does uh, on behalf of our school system. And also I'd like to mention uh, thanks to Dr. Garrett Smith for the outstanding job that he does in, in leading and and working to make sure that our kids get back in school. All right, thank you. Moving on to the regular meeting, uh, we're under item A, consideration of ordinance to amend the FY 2021 budget for the city of Stanton by adding budget amendment number three. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor and members of council, Phil Trayer, the city's chief finance officer will present this item. Madam Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Tonight, we're here to consider budget amendment number three, which totals $5,577,648 and is broken down between the general fund appropriation of $3,960,000 and school funding of $1,593,000. The general fund appropriation breakout includes FY 2020 CARES Act carryover in the amount of $2,075,961. FY21 CARES Act receipts of $1,675,221. CARES Act funding for elections in the amount of $56,278 and fund balance of $153,000 for the elimination of three furlough days for staff. All, expendit all expenditures have met the following expense criteria as outlined by the federal government. Expenses must have been necessary and incurred due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Expenses were not to be accounted for the most recent budget approved as of March 27, 2020, and expenses had to be incurred between March 1st and December 30th, 2020. Expenses have been allocated to general facilities, human resources, public safety, business recovery, rent assistance, utility assistance, child care assistance, tourism, and planning and development. The school's appropriation of $1.6 million will be used for technology to enhance remote learning as well as in-classroom learning, operational expenses for protective measures, food service, and child care. Details of the expenditures were reviewed during your September 10th, 2020 work session. A public hearing was properly advertised and conducted on September 10th, 2020, and the city manager recommends the ordinance be approved as presented. All right, are there any questions or comments? 
I have one question. Councilwoman. Um, and I, this is probably from Beauregard. Um, when, when this all, the CARES money, when in going through this process, when did, did was it, has it always been clear that everything had to be expended and used by the end of December? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Mr. Yes, yes it does. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a little uh, leeway on the end for payment of certain things, correct? Yes, we could pay up to 90 days after right. December 30th. But, but in terms of a of a delivery of something or something has, has to be completed by December 30th. And that's been, you've known that from the very beginning. Yes. Uh, yes. That's correct. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are there any additional questions? Okay. Councilman Holmes. I have, uh, have, how much of this fund have we expended? Or, yeah. or is there still money left? To, I mean, because I know that we were talking about certain thing, items that we might get buy like like police cars and stuff like that mm -hmm. you know and i just was wondering that uh if, if those would be things that we could spend the money on sure mr Trayer, do you want to try to answer the first yeah part of that well, question? we've expended or encumbered um just over two million dollars at this time um we have set aside some additional funds for utilities and some rent assistance which was outlined in in the um briefing last meeting. Um, there is probably, I'm, I'm venturing uh, seven to $800,000 left, which, which which still needs to be allotted. Um, police cars could be used. Uh, there was requests from the fire department and uh, um, guidance is, is changing constantly. I know of one locality uh, who acted on guidance as they interpreted it at the beginning of September only to find out the next day that perhaps their guidance, their action uh, was not in concert with right. what's in revised federal guidelines. So I'm not sure if I answered too much or wasn't that sure. today. So to answer your question as well, we do, so there, so when I spoke to you two weeks ago, um, at that time, I, I think we had about, there was maybe 800,000, maybe a million dollars that was kind of either uh, reserve contingency or unallocated. Um, the reserve contingency is kind of directed towards certain things. Like we know we're gonna, we could mean we're PPE or we know we could need, you know, certain types of things. Like we have, you know, HVAC issues that we might wanna try to deal with. We've got the council chambers. So there's things that haven't been spent yet out of the fund that are still in the planning phase. But what we really do need to do, and Mr. Trey and I have talked about this, is come up with kind of a final plan for you all to consider really soon because December 30th is coming up really fast. So we'll be determining very quickly what can be completed by December 30th, what can't be completed, and that would be off the table. Um, so we're gonna work on that plan very soon, come back to you in October, early November, um, to kind of finalize that for council to get your blessing. And then we'll be looking at, um, one thing we mentioned last time was the hazard pay and the payroll issues, and we're still awaiting some further guidance on that. So we're hoping that becomes a little bit more flexible on the public safety side. So that would be a good thing if that happened. So I think by then we'll have that guidance. Um, and so we'll be able to come have a final plan for you all. Yes, sir. Do you, do you reckon the question, do you foresee, or does the city foresee that, that every last dollar of that will be spent <laughs> And if it is not, yeah, we'll are we required to send it yes, back? Yes, we would be required to send any funds we do not use and we do anticipate um, using every dollar. Good, okay. Okay, are there any additional questions or comments? The only other question I have Council is- Councilwoman Dari. And have you looked at, is any of the money, have we talked about any of it going towards like community mental health needs? So I have been working very closely with uh, Dan Lehman and Anna Levitt, we have talked about that. Uh, they have been very good at helping us identify what those areas are. Um, and we've talked a little bit about mental health, but they feel confident that that area is, is covered in other ways. So the areas I mentioned to you last time were childcare, uh, rent, uh, rent and mortgage assistance, gas and electric utilities assistance. And the other item that I don't have an estimate for yet that may also um, be a, a good area to contribute to would be um, temporary housing for the underhoused. And so I'm waiting to hear from Dan Lehman about that. 
Um, but that, those are the areas they've identified for us. We talked about a lot of different areas, um, but th that's not one of the areas that they, that they saw there would be a need from the city at this time. Not that that couldn't change down the road. So we're staying in communication and being flexible, trying to be. Like the Arrow program, for example. Yeah, we talked about that. Yes, yes ma'am. And fund it through Capsule. Yeah. yeah. So exactly, it's a great example. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right. I will entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Uh, Madam Mayor, I move to adopt an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2021 budget by adding budget amendment number three, totaling $5,577,648. All right, so we have a motion. Is there a second? Madam, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Councilman Claffey. I second. <laughs> right, so we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Clerk of Council, please call the roll. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mayor O. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Motion carries. Right, thank you. And so the next item on the agenda is item B, a consideration of resolution establishing the percentage of relief at 37% for purposes of the Personal Property Tax Relief Act. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, members of Council, Maggie Reagan, the city's commissioner of the revenue will present this item. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. I am here before you this evening to ask that you uh, consider a re resolution setting the re personal property tax relief rate at 37% in order to expend the state's portion of tax relief offered to our citizens on their motor qualifying motor vehicles. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions for Ms. Reagan? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Councilwoman Darby. I move that a resolution as proposed be adopted establishing the Personal Property Tax Relief Act, PPTRA percentage at 37%. All right, we have a motion on the floor. A second. We have a second from Councilman Holmes. Any further discussion? Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Reagan. All right, the next item is item C, consideration of grant application to Augusta Health for improved access to behavioral health services for individuals involved in the criminal justice system. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, during the work session, you heard from Megan Roan, the Director of Blue Ridge Court Services, concerning this grant application. Um, we took it upon ourselves to, to tell her that she could depart for the evening, um, uh, given the, the apparent uh, straightforward nature of the, of the item before Council. So this is a uh, concerns a grant application by Blue Ridge Court Services to Augusta Health to fund a licensed clinician to facilitate weekly group and individual therapy sessions at Blue Ridge Court Services to serve that agency's clients. Uh, the deadline for the grant application was September 17, 2020. So this grant is before you for approval retroactively. There is no local match required. The total grant sought is in the amount of $25,000. Thank you. All right, are there any questions? Councilwoman Derby? No questions, but I'll make a motion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, I move the city council, council authorized staff to apply for the Augusta, to Augusta Health for a grant to fund a clinician to facilitate weekly group and individual therapy sessions at Blue Ridge Court Services retroactively to September 17th, 2020 as proposed. And I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor and we have a second by Councilman Holmes. Any further discussion? Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor O. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. 
Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Motion carries. Right, thank you. The next item is item D, consideration of uncodified emergency ordinance, ratifying, confirming, and affirming uncodified emergency ordinance 2020-04. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, let me uh, offer some background uh, in a more limited manner than I did during the work session. Um, just briefly for, largely for the benefit of the public that may be listening, um, to provide a bit of chronology, in the middle of March, on March 16th, um, I declared a local emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, just days later at a special meeting convened on March 18th, city council confirmed that declaration of local emergency. And then on March 24th, 2020, council adopted an uncodified emergency ordinance that established certain uh, procedures to ensure continuity of government. The item before you this evening is another uncodified emergency ordinance that for all practical purposes, the, the main provisions of the ordinance would extend those continuity of government provisions as proposed for a six month period of time. And those continuity of government provisions allow this body, city council and other city bodies and boards and commissions, including the Planning Commission, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Economic Development Authority, the Tourism Advisory Board as examples, uh, to utilize electronic means of conducting meetings uh, for participation by both members of the body um, as well as by members of the public. Um, so again, uh, the proposed ordinance would, would extend those procedures for a six month period. Um, during the work session, um, there was some discussion about extending for a one month period, extending perhaps for a three month period. Um, if, uh, if council desires to proceed uh, in that direction to extend for a shorter period of time. I have some uh, language that I might suggest for inclusion in a motion to be made by a member of council. Okay. Are there any questions for Mr. Rosenberg? Uh, Councilman Holmes. Steve, uh, Mr. Rosenberg, uh, I think that uh, well, we kind of talked a little bit in the back during break and, and and, and everybody seems to be willing to extend it to our first meeting in January. If, 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 if that was something that it shouldn't be a, a major problem for anybody that would get us through the holidays and into our first meeting, uh, if, if, if you don't see any problems with that. So, um, uh, so looking at a calendar, the first meeting in January is January 14th. So if we extended it to, to January 15th, it would capture that meeting and there would be the potential for um, further action on that date if it was council's desire. So if, if, if council wished to move in that direction, I think a member of council could read the suggested motion um, and uh, simply indicate that the extension um, or that or that the con so if you look at the ordinance itself that's before you uh, you're talking about changing the language of the ordinance um, so I think that the motion could be read as it's in the agenda briefing and then added to the motion could be the language change, changing lines 70 and 71 to read 
are expressly reenacted until January 15, 2021 in accordance with and subject to section 15.2-1413 of the Code of Virginia. So um, what, what you would, the maker of the motion could read the motion as it appears in the agenda briefing and then simply indicate a desire to change line 70 and 71 to change six month period to January 15, 2021. Um, the, very, uh, the last part I think of expressing uh, reacted to January 15th, uh, 2021. 21. Uh, do I need to say anything else or? or, or uh, what, what I think I, if you can if you can pick up with the rest of the lines 70 and 71, Mr. Holmes, and just can add with the remainder of the verbiage, which says in accordance with and subject to section 15.2-1413 of the Code of Virginia. Was hoping that was going to be a little easier than that. <laughs> could you could you state the motion and um, Councilman yeah, so, Holmes so, could say uh, so so, okay. So what I what I propose to Council is a motion that reads. I move to adopt the draft uncodified emergency ordinance ratifying, confirming, and affirming uncodified emergency ordinance 2020-04, changing lines 70 and 71 to read, are expressly reenacted until January 15, 2021, in accordance with and subject to Section 15.2-1413 of the Code of Virginia. Just say so moved. So moved. Mm. Just say so moved. So moved. And I'll. So we have a motion on the floor. Do we have mayor. a second? I will second that. All right. The vice mayor has second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Motion carries. Aye. Thank you. All right, so the next item on the agenda is item E, consideration of a resolution ending the local emergency declared August 8, 2020. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this item relates to the flood event on August 8th of 2020. Um, and this is an example of what I was describing to council during the work session concerning the declaration of local emergency. When the emergency response, when the emergency is ended, when the emergency response has come to its conclusion, it's necessary for an action to be taken um, to terminate the declaration of the local emergency that has in fact all occurred with regard to the flood event of August 8th so that the, uh, the emergency has concluded, the emergency response has been completed. Um, we continue as I believe I indicated to you um, previously to await notification from the Virginia Department of Emergency Management uh, concerning aid to the city and aid to the public and we expect that notification shortly. Uh, but in the meantime, you have a resolution before you uh, for your consideration to terminate or end the uh, declared local emergency. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any questions or comments? And hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Here moves. Councilwoman Holm. Uh, count, I'm so sorry, I did it to you again. <laughs> okay. I move, to, I move to adopt the draft resolution to end the local emergency declared August 8, 2020 in the city of Stanton. All right, we have a motion. Madam Mayor. All right, we have a second. We have a second. Hi, Councilman Claffey. And my apologies, I was looking at Councilwoman Darby when I said that, my apologies. Um, 
Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, I would like to state for the record under item D, when uh, Councilman Holmes said that um, he had spoken to some council members in the, uh, the back room, he spoke to some council members individually. So I just wanted that noted for the record. So, all right, moving on to the next item, um, matters from the city manager, Mr. Uh, th Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have two items to share with council, but before I do so, let me again, um, or let me suggest to the public, members of the public who wish to participate in matters from the public, this would be an opportune time to call to be placed in the queue for public comment. The number uh, which the mayor provided earlier and which appears on the regular meeting agenda is 844-854-2222. I'll read that one more time. It's 844 844- 854-2222. And when prompted, enter the access code for the meeting, which is 619-358-POUND. 619-358-POUND. Uh, the two items I have to share with council first, um, as, as I have shared with council previously, and, and as has been the subject of a media release, uh, we have our new public works director, Jeff Johnston. Um, he will be joining us on Monday. Uh, that will be his first day. Um, I look forward to bringing him to your next council meeting and introducing him to you at that meeting. Uh, Mr. Johnston was here on Friday uh, to have a meeting with uh, the employees of the Public Works Department so that they would have the opportunity uh, to meet him. He took his time and drove from his residence in Columbia, South Carolina and made a quick 24-hour trip uh, so that he would have a chance to to meet his, uh, his team at Public Works. Um, I consciously chose not to attend. I thought that that should be a Public Works function uh, to give uh, Mr. Johnston you know, an opportunity um, to, to have time with his team. And, but I do understand for both him and from interim director Dave Irvin that um, he was well received. And I think that everyone is looking forward to um, the beginning of a new relationship on, on Monday. Um, secondly, I want to share with you uh, that we are moving forward with plans to open the visitor center. Uh, Cheryl Wagner, our tourism director, tells me today that she's targeting the second weekend in October for a reopening. Um, I've authorized the hiring of the necessary staff um, in order to staff the visitor center. It will be staffed uh, for reduced hours in comparison to the pre-pandemic schedule. Um, and so there will result some savings to the city, but uh, Cheryl has come up with the schedule that she believes is appropriate um, given the current environment. Uh, we, uh, I know anecdotally we hear of increased uh, tourism traffic. I learned from Cheryl several days ago uh, that the uh, Hotel 24 South had its first sellout um, a couple of weekends ago, I believe, uh, which is a good strong sign of returning activity. And, um, you know, certainly the Dine Out and Downtown Initiative continues to, uh, um, to do well for our downtown restaurants and retailers. And we'll be having discussions that has been extended until Sunday, November 1st. Um, and we will um, be exploring a possible further extension of that date more deeply in, into the fall season. And uh, Ms. Wagner and Greg Bean with SDVA and Ms. Beauregard will, will all be um, considering that subject in, in the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. 
All right, thank you. Next on the agenda is matters from the public. Um, we will take calls um, from our citizens on Zoom first. You have um, five minutes to speak. Please state your name, your address, and uh, then you may speak. After um, we take uh, folks from Zoom, we will then um, take our citizens in the audience. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, first, uh, asking if the caller whose number ends in 75 is on the line. Is the caller whose number ends in 75 on the line? Is the caller whose number ends in 00 on the line? Hi, yes, are you able to hear me? Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Hi, my name is Allison Profeta. I live on Farrier Court in Stanton. I wanted to thank you all for extending the uncodified emergency ordinance. And I wanted to speak to some of the issues around that that I'm hoping you'll get a deeper understanding of prior to um, its expiration in January. Um, I, Mr. Claffey mentioned in the work session that there are boards and commissions who are holding in-person meetings and some of them who are holding completely online meetings and some of them who are hybrid like city council. Eliminating that um, emergency ordinance would mean none of them could do those things. They would all have to meet in person. And I want you to please, I understand that some of you maybe aren't as concerned about the virus and that's completely understandable and your own health choices, but there are some people who are at high risk that are on these boards and commissions. And I know that because I attend several of the different meetings um, each month. And my concern is that some of those boards and commissions may end up going months without being able to have a quorum. Um, in addition, I would like to urge you to keep in mind that during a global health emergency, it would be wonderful if the city of Stanton could make their meetings as accessible as possible. And as a single mother who doesn't want to think about what would happen if something happened to me and my kids were left alone, I am very passionate about the city, but I'm also very scared about attending meetings in person. And I know I'm not the only one. Um, in addition, when this comes up for a vote again on January 14th, I would just like to remind you that um, I, I could be wrong, but from what I've read, we've had spikes after each of the last three major holidays. That was Memorial Day, July 4th, and Labor Day, which is probably the spike we're seeing right now. Um, and so when you meet on January 14th, if you could just take into consideration that uh, the Christmas and end of year, other end of year holidays will have happened and there's the potential that we could be in the middle of a spike at that time and maybe you might want to extend it a little further to make sure that that isn't happening. And then finally, um, for anyone who's listening, I just want to remind everybody that Habitat for Humanity in Stanton suffered a devastating fire this week. And if anybody um, is able to, if you could go to their website and maybe make a donation, they've done so much for our community. and. Um, I would just love for the community to support them right back. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Profeta. Next. Is the caller whose number ends in 53 on the line? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. This is Mark Judah. I live at 221 Sunnyside Street in Stanton but I'm not a Stanton native. I'm a transplant. I was born and grew up in the West Texas oil patch of Odessa. I wasn't on the Friday Night Lights football team, nor was I interested in livestock or oil. Luckily, a teacher in the high school many years before I was born 
developed a project with her students. They envisioned and built a somewhat accurate replica of Shakespeare's Globe Theater smack in the middle of a Petroplex in Odessa, a blue collar salt of the earth town. Before I knew what algebra was, I had attended national touring and summer stock Shakespeare. It opened a window on my childhood that has informed my life ever since. At the tail end of 1999, I moved here to work with what was then known as Shenandoah Shakespeare. I was a part of the shows and opened up the Blackfriars Playhouse. A special performance for all the construction and tradespeople allowed me to witness the pride of the community as in being showing their work off to their families. I imagine that one of those kids might follow a path similar to mine. I met my wife here, who was also an actor then. We bought a house here. Then we left. I went to grad school, worked in New York, and we moved back several years ago as our family began to grow. We moved back here because our community in San had also continued to grow, and we wanted to be here. It wasn't just the American Shakespeare Center community that was thriving, though the partnership with Mary Baldwin's Shakespeare Performance Program and Stanton's Dining and Cultural Offerings that are reliant on that tourism were immense increases to that community. But it was the melding of the growing art scene, forward thinking and honest decency that we wanted to rejoin. In the last few months, as this new council has fumbled into office with an unannounced reschedule of a canceled 4th of July parade, Dubious security concerns with even shadier and apotic self-serving overtime employment from an irregular source for such issues, and in civil incivility and incompetence as you thrash procedure, regular order, and decency in dealing with your fellow council members as you push through your seemingly prearranged designs. Two weeks ago, you went back on the word of this council. These last several months, we have seen the community come together to support each other through this pandemic the economic fallout and two 100-year floods. Neighbors who don't know each other giving to and helping each other out. Yet the agreement that this council made with the American Shakespeare Center to finally purchase the transportation hub property on North Lewis Street that the city had been using for years was snatched back and ripped up with no public input or even advance notice that such a backtrack would happen. You may not have agreed with the decision when it was made, you may be posturing as a penny-pinching good fiscal steward in uncertain times, but you crossed your brother, your neighbor, your community, because you are unsure of what could happen. What is certain is that you cannot be trusted, and your lack of transparency shows that you know it is wrong. When people make plans because what you have promised and then you change horses in midstream, it hurts them. And you didn't even pause to backtrack our city manager expressed concern or when a constituent remarked on the fallout for the marginalized who rely on access to that transportation hub in their lives. My dad, who died a couple of years ago, wasn't able to give me much when it comes to possessions, but he did give me my morals and character. He told me that if your word is worthless, then you are worthless. I have no disillusions that the majority of this council will reconsider their un unkind behavior of reneging on their word of the council, though I hope that you see the damage that you have caused your brother and your neighbor. I must give my voice to my community that we see what you are and what you are doing. We will be watching and pushing you to act ethically and competently. Your offenses have been ranked. They smell to heaven. Get your act together. And for full disclosure, though affiliated at times, I am not a current employee of the ASC. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next caller. There's a caller whose number ends in 79 on the line. Hello, yes. Please state na your name and address and address your comments to council. Uh, good evening. This is Aaron Barber. I live uh, at my house on Fayette Street in Stanton, Virginia. Um, I wanted to begin my remarks to council. Can, can you hear me all, please? Yes, if you could speak up just a little, it would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Um, I just wanted to read you some remarks uh, that I took some notes during uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased that you all have chosen to act professionally and uh, keep in mind that there's some decorum to be had and some transparency to be had as you conduct city business. 
Um, thank you for demonstrating that it is, in fact, possible from you. Um, I know it was a nice gesture. Maybe I'm just being, like, squirmy, but Councilman Holmes, don't share your classes with people, okay, dude? Um, Mr. Robertson, uh, you take it upon yourself so quite frequently to make remarks about uh, the general health, and uh, you have a you seem to have a particular outlook on the pandemic uh, in particular. Um, perhaps since even before you were elected, when you famously made the remark that uh, COVID was likely nothing worse than a flu, um, I wonder how your thoughts have changed on that. You might look for me to follow up with you about that next week. Uh, the last thing I would say to you, uh, Council, uh, Councilman uh, Robertson, is that as a pharmacist, yes, you probably should stop trying to dispense medical advice outside of your druggist's profession. It would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, Mr. Plaffey, uh, the nomination which you were congratulate, congratulating, sir, uh, I will be following up you in the week ahead about uh, a better picture of that. Uh, please be prepared. Uh, Councilwoman Mead, uh, I appreciate you uh, highlighting the importance of our stormwater and our wastewater management. Um, I would like to read any recommendations arising from uh, the meetings of the stormwater management uh, committee or board, however it's named. Uh, Mayor Oaks, I noted that you yourself, as did um, I think everyone except uh, Councilmember Mead and uh, Dull, you you passed the opportunity to at least say the name of someone like Brianna Taylor. Um, your loss, uh, you'll probably have more, but you know that. Uh, Mr. Plappy, I would like uh, furthermore to clarify for you that I'm, I'm a little curious about your resistance to emergency planning extension. Perhaps you're unfamiliar with the purpose of continuity of government. I would like to direct you to read a really good book that touches upon some, some regional and local history. Um, it's called Raven Rock, like the, you know, a raven, and a, you know, a rock. Um, it was written by uh, the author. His name is Garrett, G-A-R. R E T T Graf G R A F F. It talks all about the history of uh, emergency disaster planning and continuity of government efforts, specifically as it relates to um, how the government, and especially the Pentagon, needed to prepare the public for the imminent uh, nuclear war, which y'all grew up worrying about and still haunts us. Um, I would also like to change from those remarks. It's called Raven Rock, Mr. Flappy. You should read that book. Um, I'd also like to switch then to say to uh, Mr. Trayer, um, I appreciate uh, his plain spoken analysis of the city's money picture. Um, it makes it much easier for a layperson like myself to understand these stakes. Um, and I, I also appreciate uh, Ms. Beauregard's uh, preparedness uh, and and willing and continuing efforts to brief members of council on some of the options that are available to them to get money into much needed programs, which center the least represented and poorest usually. Um, I would like Ms. Bogard to please clarify her remarks that uh, funding for mental health in this area is kind of good to go. I'll, I'll be following up with you about that, Ms. Beauregard. I would like to, in closing, uh, congratulate each of you for having five unanimous consent motions this evening, and I hope that if you all are going to be on the level, you can do that again and again and again with the people's right. time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller Mike? Is the caller whose number ends in zero two on the line? Is the caller whose number ends in six eight on the line? Oh yes, that's me. Hi, this is Miss Narcisi. I'm at one thirty South Jefferson Street, and uh, you might be surprised to find out that I wanted to call in to thank you for extending the 
uncodified emergency ordinance, ordinance so that procedures that allow city council and other bodies of the city to conduct their business safely can continue at least until January 14th. Let me preface what I have to say about the ordinance by sharing with you why I'm not at City Hall this evening to speak to you face to face. Earlier this week, I was notified by a friend that they were not feeling well and had decided to go get a COVID test. Without a confirmed negative result, and because I had merely been in their presence for more than two hours in an enclosed space, I decided that staying at home would be the safest decision for my friends and neighbors who might come into contact with me if I was an asymptomatic carrier. I made this decision even in spite of the fact that we were mutually masked and safely distanced. Let me clarify, I am not ill. I have practiced the most stringent safety protocols whenever possible, and yet I could potentially be a carrier of a deadly virus to members of the community I love. Therefore, I stayed home. I would suggest that all members of our community should practice this type of compassion and action, especially when they are at high risk of being a carrier themselves. Council Member Holmes, I want to reassure you that you not only have the right to use Zoom as an appropriate platform to fulfill your duties here, you also have a responsibility to do so if you believe that you are putting others at greater risk when you attend in person. I am thrilled that you are not reversing course in the middle of this ongoing pandemic. I encourage you to actually explore additional options to engage residents through technology without requiring in-person contact. Shifting to new formats that would allow for greater accessibility to teleconferencing or video streaming services to provide residents with live access to council, board, and commission meetings is actually preferable and will save lives. I suggest that to combat any additional cost of using technology to do so, say like the Zoom fees that Council Member Darby was worried about, can be easily covered by city council members agreeing to forego their daily stipend for the dinners that they charge to the city on days that they choose to attend meetings in person, or by letting the police department provide security from non-existent threats instead of funneling money to departments run by their family members. Stay home, save lives, save money. It is literally a win, win, win situation for Stanton citizens. Some additional reasons that I support your vote to continue the ordinance are the fact that BDH data on COVID cases in Stanton very clearly defines that the number of new daily cases in our city is greater than comparable figures for the state. That means that we are not doing our job to decrease the spread as well as other localities are. Scientists and public health experts warn of mounting evidence that the coronavirus is airborne, transmitted through tiny droplets called aerosols that linger in the air much longer than the larger globs that come from coughing or sneezing. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is continuing to review this issue, but many agree that aerosols are thought to be the main way the virus spreads. Badly ventilated indoor spaces are particularly dangerous. Earlier this week, Stanton reported 243 cases, Waynesboro 255 and Augusta County 469. We have not flattened our curve and our numbers have remained stubbornly high throughout September. In the United States, over 200,000 people have died, and we average 830 deaths a day. Again, I am thrilled that we are not taking the risk to return to in-person meetings when we don't need to, especially when the hybrid model actually offers for greater access to meetings for citizens and council members who have the right to remain involved with city governance while staying safely at home. Also, the final reason I agree with your vote tonight is because Stanton City Schools have made the wise decision to continue the school year virtually to protect students, staff, and their families. I am glad that you also adopted this policy for city meetings as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 02 on the line? Is the caller whose number ends in 02 on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Yes, my name is Darlene Schneck. I live at 1410 North Coulter Street, apartment 204 in Stanton. I'm just calling to, um, um, again, agree with the, the last caller. I, I, I really uh, appreciate uh, that we, uh, are paying attention to the numbers and that we need to be careful moving forward with uh, the COVID. It, it is not under control. 
And I really would urge City Council to look at a video option for those who cannot attend uh, City Council meetings for whatever reason. I personally have asthma and I cannot risk getting COVID-19 and not being able to see all your faces is a real drawback to me. So I do urge you to upgrade your technology and allow for video uh, video to um, for everybody to see the city council meetings by video. I think if our school children can learn over video, our government can adapt as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller. There are no further callers, Madam Mayor. All right. In that case, we will um, take matters from the public, um, our citizens in the audience. If anyone would care to come to the podium to speak, feel free. Yes, Madam Mayor, my name is Sarah Crenshaw. I reside at 9 Willowview Drive, Stanton, Virginia. I'm stepping forward just to say that these past few months, I've never seen an election so bitter as the election of our council members. This has been, to me, just horrifying. And then to recently see in the paper negativity about ambushing a meeting and doing things unethical. I think the people of Stanton spoke during the election and they voted for what they wanted. I think that is what we need to accept and go forward and move forward. I'd like to reiterate with you, uh, Councilman Holmes, that yes, we need to stop being petty, stop looking at who's one party and what's another political party, and you need to come together for the city of Stanton. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, good evening. Hi. My name is Dave Copper. I live at uh, 1603 Ridgeway Drive in Stanton, uh, up on the hill, a little around the corner from the last sinkhole in Stanton. Uh, I would just like to thank Council for this well-run meeting. I, I congratulate you on your decorum and your um, Peacefulness. Thank you. Uh, I and, and I want to congratulate uh, the city of Stanton, um, Stanton Police Department, Park and Recreation on the good job they're doing with Gypsy Hill Park. The uh, speed limit signs I hope are helpful. There are, I believe, um, two or three additional ones on each side counting the ones at each entrance. Uh, the speed bumps help where the speed bumps are, but as a frequent visitor to the park with my uh, faithful companion, Jack, uh, still see a lot of speedy, young and old, uh, rich and poor probably. Um, I, I'm not sure if the decoy police car helped much, but uh, you know, I noticed it. I thought, boy, that policeman's been in that bathroom a long time. <laughs> so, uh, and, I, and I wonder about the, uh, you know, the uh, additional money from the federal government going to police cars when there's one or two sitting around neighbor, neighborhoods empty. Uh, that money can be uh, utilized for, for more uh, Important things, I believe, that would uh, help our police department with possible uh, mental health workers on, on available to go on calls where there is a mental health emergency. Um, I think that money could be utilized in, in a more positive manner. Uh, police cars, I guess, would that mean more hiring of policemen? Um, I. I Certainly give credit to the uh, Stanton police for doing a great job. Um, but, but as a, uh, mm, a transfer from New Jersey, I've been here 15 years, and I've ut utilized that beautiful park, which I believe is the jewel of Stanton. And uh, I'm just amazed that more people haven't been hit. Uh, you know, I know the golf course is uh, in question at this time. Um, 
I would love to see no vehicular traffic in the park. Um, of course, that would mean uh, developing parking lots for all the traffic that goes through there. And uh, I, I personally ha I have a problem with keeping my mouth shut when I, I see someone that's obviously going a little faster than 15. Uh, so uh, for my own safety, I, I would like that to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Deborah Kushner, and I live at 1311 North Augusta Street. I applaud the council for the civility with which you've done tonight's meeting. Thank you for that. So my remarks were written before tonight's meeting. Who wouldn't vote for candidates vowing fiscal responsibility? The bogus security issue blew that platform and quickly. But these items, parade, security, Robert's Rules of Order, COVID, transportation hubs, show your real platform, divisiveness, intimidation, and lawlessness. When there are so many other vital issues to this city like racial injustice, health, healthcare, evictions, income loss, you choose to focus on the petty ones. In less than three months, you have become local celebrities for ignoring the real issues. If you're not serving the least advantage of us, you don't serve Stanton. I truly like to comment in a positive way to encourage you to rise above partisan posturing and consider the big picture in these difficult times. I'd like to think you'd help any person in need regardless of party affiliation. But with each passing city council meeting, except tonight, I see what a stretch that is. When you silence and belittle fellow council members, when you are willing to risk infection by COVID to meet in person when the rest of the world has become Zoom savvy months ago, when you monkey with the agenda at the last minute, betraying the obvious collusions between you when you leave the city manager and staff out of the established process by doing due diligence and their jobs, when flagrantly ignoring the very rules you're sworn to abide by, then encouraging comments are certainly lost on you. This is an exceptionally friendly city. I can rarely go for a walk without meeting someone, striking up a friendly conversation but the gang of four can't even show respect for city council members. Where is your civility? The disrespect you show is for anyone outside of your gang, which is a bully, bullies club. I would like to point out how the Roberts Rules of Order addresses points of order, which was brought up at the last session. In Roberts Rules of Order, newly revised, a point of order may be raised if the rules appear to have been broken. This may interrupt a speaker during debate or anything else if the breach of the rules warrants it. The point is resolved before business continues. Mayor Oates, you did not seek resolution to a point of order. Council member Dull brought up in the last meeting. I think it was the last meeting. Instead, you shut her down. It is you who are out of order. I will thank you for waking up Stantonians to the importance of voting. You are giving Democrats and like-minded people the best reason to turn out to vote. In a small city like Stanton, we should care more about neighbors than party affiliation. May the next city council incarnation return to that ideal. Until then, I hold a shred of hope that you will awaken to honor and abide by your sworn responsibility to serve the community, not just the few entitled. Somewhere within you is a small spark of humanity that I urge you to kindle. We'll be waiting, watching, scrutinizing, and most importantly, acting to make certain you are held accountable.
Great, thank you. Anyone else? All right, hearing none, I would like to say that your mayor will remember her glasses at the next meeting. <laughs> Um, and with that, as the mayor of the city of Stanton, I call this meeting adjourned.